the next question we can ask is how long these transfers will take. And this is given to us by something known as Lambert's time of flight theorem. And it turns out that the time of flight is solely a function of the initial problem geometry and the semi-major axis of the selected orbit. So we can write the time of flight as a function only of, that is the function of the semi-major axis of our transfer ellipse, the sum of the distances between the central focus and P1 and P2, and the difference between those two differences. Let's see what this result actually looks like. We again have a setup where we, we select a semi-major axis of the ellipse, and we have constant R1 and R2, and therefore constant sums of their magnitudes and differences of their magnitudes. What we control is our ability to dial in the semi-major axis of the transfer and then move around the locations of F star, the vacant focus. We are going to consider the bounding case where we have an orbit with infinite specific energy. That's that one with the vacant focus at F star naught. In this case, we have pure rectilinear motion between P1 and P2. We have a fully one-dimensional system. And so in this case only, the thing that I keep saying isn't true happens to be true. In this case, we can write that the velocity magnitude, which is the magnitude of the orbital velocity, also happens to be equal to the derivative of the magnitude of the position vector. So let's be very careful here. In general, this is not a true statement. In the case where our specific energy is infinite and we are traveling literally along a perfect straight line, this is the only time that we can write this. But if we are able to write this, then we can take advantage of the vis viva integral, which in this case only is dr dt quantity squared. And from this, we write, that is dt is equal to one over the square root of the gravitational parameter times r, over the square root of 2r minus r squared over a dr. We have exact differentials on both sides, so we would like to integrate this, but we are not interested in an indefinite integral in this case. Here we want the definite integral that represents the time of transfer between p1 and p2, which means that for the right-hand integral, we need the limits that represent the specific arc between p1 and p2. We can get this by, again, thinking about the geometry of the problem, We've previously written many times the sum of the line segments between P1, P2, and the vacant focus are the sum of the two radii, R1 and R2, and the difference between these two is the norm of the difference between the two radii, which we can call R1 or L2. And that means that P1 F star is s minus r1 or l2 using our previously defined s value. And similarly, p2 f star is equal to just s. And therefore, these represent the limits of integration on the r side of our integral. So putting all of this together, we can write, and it turns out this equation, which is Lambert's theorem or the time of flight theorem, applies to every possible transfer type. And you can actually go through the exercise of evaluating this integral for all the possible values of A. And when you do that, you get this result. Here are the transfer times for each of our possible types of transfer. We have the short wave elliptical transfers, the long wave elliptical transfers, the parabolas, and the two families of hyperbola. And there is a distinction between these. So E1, for example, which you may recall is the transfer, the short wave transfer shown here, will have this term minus this term, whereas E4, which is the short wave transfer of the other ellipse, will have the summation of these two terms, and so on. The quantities alpha and beta, and for the hyperbola, gamma and delta, are defined implicitly via this, these trigonometric and hyperbolic relationships. This column also shows the corresponding semi-parameter of each of these transfer orbits, 
with again there being a distinction between the E1, E4, E2, E3, H1, H2 via the various distributions of positive and negative signs. And something to be very careful about is to note that E1 has a minus here and a plus here, whereas E4 has a plus here and a minus here, and so on. So we have now characterized every possible two-body transfer between two fixed points, P1 and P2. We can non-dimensionalize this problem, again, following the example of Kaplan, 1976. We can define the non-dimensionalized specific energy, E star, which is given by negative the ratio of the semi-major axis of the minimum specific energy transfer scaled by the semi-major axis of any other transfer. We can define the non-dimensionalized transfer time as the square root of the gravitational parameter of the central body divided by the cube of the same major axis of the minimum specific energy transfer times the transfer time of your specific transfer. And finally, we have this parameter k, which essentially gives us the relationship between the original geometry of the problem. So k is fixed by the problem, and a and t are what you get by choosing a specific transfer. And here we're plotting between the bounds of k equals 0 and k equals 1, with an intermediate k equals 0 0.5 as an example. And here you have all of your possible families of transfers. The parabolas always lie on the zero specific energy line. And then above it, positive energies are the two hyperbolic families. And below it are the four elliptical families. And you will notice that there's essentially no cases until so you start talking about incredibly high energies and incredibly low transfer times where you cannot match the performance of a hyperbolic transfer with an elliptical transfer. So even if you need to get somewhere very quickly, chances are that you can use one of these elliptical transfers. You will also notice that we, are, we can extend this indefinitely. And this idea maps to the physics of multi-revolution transfers. You are not limited to a delta nu of just zero to two pi. Delta nu can be arbitrarily large. The transfer time can be arbitrarily large. And you can take many, many orbital periods around the central body to get to where you're finally going. And this is especially useful when you're trying to go to somewhere very far away using a very small amount of energy. Hidden behind all of this is a problem. And that is that in order to apply any of this, we need to know those original vectors R1 and R2, which you will recall represent the locations of our points P1 and P2 at two different times. If we are planning this as a trajectory design problem, then we are essentially saying that we want to go between two points in space, but we don't know when we leave and we don't know when we arrive. Those are completely open. This is particularly annoying in the case where you're trying to go between two moving objects. The idea is that P1 and P2 are themselves in orbit around the central focus. Again, as a means of visualization, think about going from the Earth to Mars. The Earth and Mars are moving. If I choose a different departure time, Earth will be in a different place. If I choose a different arrival time, Mars will be in a different place. So what do I do? Well, I have to do an iterative process. I select a departure time and an arrival time, and that sets my R1 and R2 vector. I determine all the possible orbits, then I choose the best one, best usually meaning the least energetic or the one that leads to the least fuel usage if I'm talking about a spacecraft design. I then see if that orbit's transfer time matches the time, the delta t uh, that I assumed. And if it doesn't, then I adjust everything accordingly and go on and iterate numerically until I've converged on something where my transfer orbit's transfer time matches my assumed departure and arrival times. That all sounds good in theory, but how do we actually put this into practice? There are a lot of different methods of implementing this, but one of the most ubiquitous ones is based on the universal variable formulation of the two-body problem. 